Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum. My name is Tane Danger, and I am the director of the forum. For more than 40 years, the Town Hall Forum has invited speakers of conscience to address the issues of the day from an ethical perspective. We're pleased to welcome climate scientist Catherine Hayhoe of the Nature Conservancy to the forum. Dr. Hayhoe's talk is co-presented with the Great Northern Festival, which celebrates our cold, creative winters with 10 days of diverse programming. The festival is featuring a series of discussions with different leaders on climate. Learn more about their climate solutions series and all the other great programs happening during the festival at their website, thegreatnorthernfestival.com. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our media sponsors. MinPost is a source of nonpartisan news coverage of Minnesota and beyond. You can find them at minpost.com. Sahan Journal, which covers issues affecting Minnesota immigrants and communities of color. Learn more about Sahan Journal at sahanjournal.com. And thanks as always to Minnesota Public Radio for recording and broadcasting all of the forum's programs. One last important piece of housekeeping. All town hall forum programs are entirely free and open to all. That is thanks to the generosity of supporters. Individuals are the largest source of funding for everything the forum does. So if you are able, we would ask you to consider supporting the town hall forum, which you can do at our website, westminsterforum.org. Now, it is my pleasure to move us to our feature presentation and introduce our guest moderator for today's forum. Today's program with Catherine Hayhoe kicks off a season at the Westminster Town Hall Forum focused on climate science and solutions. We are presenting this season in partnership with the McKnight Foundation, a family foundation based in Minnesota that advances a more just, creative, and abundant future where people and planet thrive. McKnight annually grants about $100 million in support of climate solutions in the Midwest, in equitable and inclusive Minnesota, the arts, neuroscience, and international crop research. Today's conversation with Dr. Hayhoe will be guest moderated by the president of the McKnight Foundation, Tanya Allen. Tanya heads an all-women, majority people of color senior leadership team and a diverse staff of about 50 people at McKnight. Like our speaker, Catherine Hayhoe, Tanya is passionate about bringing unlikely allies together. And throughout her 25-year career, she has been a bridge builder and a civic diplomat. Tanya leads successful philanthropic, business, government, and community partnerships that catalyze fresh thinking, test new approaches, and advance public policy. Please help me in welcoming our guest moderator for today's Westminster Town Hall Forum, Tanya Allen. Hello, my name is Tanya Allen. I serve as the president of the McKnight Foundation, and I'm pleased to be guest moderating today's Westminster Town Hall Forum with Katherine Hayhoe. Dr. Katherine Hayhoe serves as the chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy. She is an accomplished atmospheric scientist responsible for the Nature Conservancy's wider portfolio of global climate advocacy and adaptation work. She has served as the lead author on the second, third, and fourth national climate assessments. Her most recent book, Saving Us, a Climate Scientist's Case for Hope and Healing in a Divided World is a candid look at the science of climate change and what can be done about it. She's a remarkable communicator. Catherine has received the National Center for Science Education's Friend of the Planet Award, the American Geophysical Union's Climate Communication Prize, the Sierra Club's Distinguished Service Award, and has been named to a number of lists, including Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People, Foreign Policy's 100 Leading Thinkers, Fortune Magazine's World Greatest Leaders, and the United Nations Champion of the Earth in Science and Innovation. 
Please help me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Dr. Katherine Hayhoe. Dr. Hayhoe, we're so excited to hear from you. So let me turn it to you. Thank you so much. So I'm a climate scientist, and I study what climate change means to us here and now in the places where we live. We've had people studying climate for over 200 years, and that's why we know without a shadow of a doubt that climate is changing, that humans are responsible, we really have checked, it's not volcanoes or natural cycles or the sun. In fact, according to natural factors right now, we should be getting very, very slowly, gradually cooler rather than warming faster and faster. We know the impacts are serious and we know that there are solutions if we act now and our actions matter. In fact, the conclusions of the most recent intergovernmental panel on climate change report were very clear. They said, Every year matters, every action matters, and every choice matters. What's at stake when it comes to climate change? It's not about saving the planet, as we so often think it is. Rather, it's about saving us. The planet will still be orbiting the sun long after we're gone. The question is, what will happen to human civilization? Because everything we have and everything we've built is for a planet that no longer exists. It is now warmer than any time in human history on this planet, and that's why it matters. Yet we continue planning based on the past, and that's like we're driving down the road looking exclusively in the rearview mirror. It works great if the road is straight, if climate isn't changing, but today we are on an unprecedented curve that is bigger than any that we humans have ever hit before. And it is past time to take our eyes off the rearview mirror and look ahead at what's coming in the future. Because the further we get from the conditions that our civilization are built on, the average temperature and rainfall that existed when we allocated our agricultural land, when we built our cities, when we um, allocated our water resources, the farther we get from it, the greater the risk for all of us. So if that's the case, if what is literally at stake is human civilization as we know it, our food, our water, the safety of our homes, our infrastructure, our economy, and more, then why aren't we doing much about it? Maybe we think, well, people aren't scared enough, so we need to hit them upside the head with some more scary facts. Here's the problem with that approach. First of all, we've already had the facts for a very long time. We've known since the 1850s that digging up and burning coal back then and oil and natural gas today produces heat trapping gases that are building up in the atmosphere, wrapping an extra blanket around the planet. Scientists were sufficiently concerned about the impacts of climate change to take the unprecedented step of warning a US president about the dangers these posed for humans and human civilization and human society and that president was Lyndon B. Johnson, and that year was 1965. And even worse, new social science shows that more facts on a topic that's already very politically polarized, and climate change is among the most politically polarized topics in the whole US, more facts on divisive issues polarize us more, not less. So as neuroscientist Tali Sherratt says in her book, The Influential Mind, she says, our brains are programmed to get a kick out of information. So we like new information usually, but when we give people new information, they typically only accept it if they already believe it. If it contradicts what they believe, their brain shuts off. And in the United States, work by Yale University researcher Dan Cahan has showed that in fact, the more we know about science, the more we know about facts and data, the more polarized we are. We don't come closer together, we come closer apart or further apart. So if more facts aren't the answer, why won't dumping scary information change people's minds? Well, another reason is because believe it or not, most people are already worried. In the United States, 70%, yeah, not seven, 70% of people are already worried about climate change. 83% of mothers 
are worried about climate change. 86% of young people are worried about climate change. But only 8% of us are activated. Only 8. Only 8% of us are doing anything about it, even though the vast majority of us are worried. Why not? It's because we don't know what to do. And if we don't know what to do, then more fear-filled information just paralyzes us. To continue, quoting neuroscientist Tally Sherratt, she says, and this is just speaking of the way the human brain works, not climate change specifically. She says, fear and anxiety cause us to withdraw, to freeze, to give up rather than take action. So if dumping more fear-based facts on people isn't going to motivate them to act, if we're already worried but not activated, what can we do? We need to tackle the two problems that are really holding us back. And those problems are not lack of education or information on the science. Those two problems are that we don't understand why it matters to us here and now in ways that are relevant to our lives. We understand how it matters to the polar bears and the ice caps, but you know, I live in the Twin Cities. What's it doing to my life? And we don't know what to do to fix it, or even worse, we think we know and we don't want to. These two conditions have names. The first one is called psychological distance and the second one is called solution aversion. Psychological distance is something that we humans are prone to in many different areas of risk. We don't eat what we should, we don't exercise enough, we don't save what we should for retirement. We think of the risks of the health risks or the financial risks of what we're doing as being distant and far away in time or space or relevance to us. That's what psychological distance is. We see something as saying, sure, it's a problem, but not for me. And when we look at the data on public opinion in the United States and in Minnesota specifically, we see psychological distance on climate change loud and clear. Let me give you some examples. So in Minnesota, 71% of people agree, sure, global warming is happening. 73% um, agree it will harm plants and animals and future generations. In other words, people in the future, not now, plants and animals, not humans. 66% agree it will harm people in developing countries, so people over there, but not here. So we agree it's a risk, but we see it as far away in space or time or relevance. And then... Yale University researchers asked people one more question. Do you think it will affect you? The numbers plummet. Only 38% of Minnesotans think climate change will affect us. That's psychological distance. What's solution aversion? It's the idea that we think the cure is worse than the disease. Or we don't even know what to do about it. We think, I'm just one person. What can I do? Or we think, well, we're told that the only solutions to climate change are negative and punitive and sacrificial. They will decrease our quality of life. I can't drive. I can't fly. I can't eat meat. I can't have children. I can't use electricity. I can't do anything. All I can do is live in a cave and eat raw vegetables. And I don't want to live like that, so I don't want to fix this problem. Solution aversion is responsible for 99% of climate denial. It isn't that people seriously doubt physics that we've known for over 200 years. It's that people don't want to fix it because they think the only solutions are negative. But if I say it's a real problem and I don't want to fix it, that would make me a bad person. So instead, our brain goes out through a process of motivated reasoning and we find reasons why we don't want to fix it. And it's not real or it's not us or it's not a big deal are great reasons that people come up with. And that's why we hear them so much. But underlying that is solution aversion. I don't want to fix it. Okay, so if psychological distance and solution aversion are the real problems, what am I supposed to do about that? You might be thinking, I'm just one person. How can I make a difference? Well, believe it or not, you, not me, the scientist, but you, whoever you are, you are the perfect person to do something about this. And the first step is so simple, at first you might not even believe me. It's doing something that most of us are not doing, which is simply talking about it. In Minnesota, 64% of people never talk about climate change. 
In surrounding states, it's even higher, 67% in Wisconsin, 70% in the Dakotas. Why don't we talk about it? Well, we might think I'm not a scientist, or I don't want to start an argument, or why does it even matter? I have better things to talk about, or I don't know what to do about it, so talking about it is just going to be depressing. Those are all very good reasons not to talk about it. I don't like any of those reasons either. But here's the difference. I'm not asking you to come up with, you know, all the scientific facts, because as we just saw, that's not what changes people's minds or activates them. I'm not asking you to start an argument with Uncle Joe either. I'm asking you to share why it matters and what we can do about it. And what does that accomplish? Well, um, UK expert George Marshall, who wrote a great book called Don't Even Think About It, How Our Brains Are Wired to Ignore Climate Change, he says, what we choose to discuss with people we know helps them understand what's important to our community. Talk is the fertile field in which cultural change begins. Without it, it's impossible for any group of people to solve a problem. Imagine trying to solve any problem without communicating. And your words can have much more of an impact than you might imagine. So um, where people choose to invest their money or what energy source they use at home, how they travel, what they eat, all these actions begin with conversations. And so in turn, conversations underpin all climate action. Having conversations about climate change in our daily lives knocks over the first domino to social change. We take our cues, all of us, we take our cues about what's important from what we hear from, from our family, our friends, our colleagues, and our neighbors. And so when we have these conversations, it's the first step to helping people understand why it matters and what we can do to fix it. To put it a different way, talking engages something that is orders of magnitude bigger than our personal carbon footprint. It engages our climate shadow. How we talk with people we work uh, with, with people we worship with, with people we live near, with friends and family and people we know. Advocating for change at our school creates much bigger impact than in our home. Advocating for change at a place of work can have an order, an impact that's, you know, a hundred times bigger than if I made a change in my personal life. Now, don't get me wrong. I make changes in my personal life too. But it's really, it's not about changing my individual lifestyle. It is about changing the world. It's about changing the system. And how do we do that? We change the system when individuals use their voices to talk about why it matters and what we can do to fix it. So let's zoom in on Minnesota. How do we do this for Minnesota? How do we talk about how climate change matters in Minnesota and what solutions look like in Minnesota? Here we go. So Minnesota has already warmed by two degrees Fahrenheit in the last century. That might not sound like much, but over the whole history of humans on this planet, our average temperature has been as stable as that of the human body. Average global temperature has gone up by a few tenths of a degree up and down, the same amount that our body temperature goes up and down over the course of a day. But if your body temperature is running a two degree fever, you start to get a bit worried. You might take some medicine, you might call your doctor. It shows that something's wrong. And that's exactly what we see happening today. It isn't just about the averages though. The biggest way climate change is affecting us is not through global warming, but through global weirding. In other words, it's taking our natural weather dice and loading them against us. And I actually have a little PBS series on YouTube called Global Weirding for that reason. So wherever we live, it's as if we have a pair of dice and we always have a chance of rolling a double six, a flood, a heat wave, a storm, a drought. But as the world warms decade by decade, it's as if it's sneaking in and taking one of those numbers on our dice and turning it into another six or even a seven. And all of a sudden, you know, if you live in Houston, Texas, I live in Texas myself, people are saying, we just had three 500 year flood events in three years. How could that happen? The answer is global weirding. So what's happening in Minnesota? How is climate change loading the weather dice against us? Well, heat waves. I don't know about you, but I grew up in Toronto. So, you know, just on the other side of the border. And I grew up in a house that didn't have air conditioning because we didn't need it. 
And now our summer heat waves are so extreme that my parents have installed air conditioning and most people need it. We also know that hotter and drier summer conditions increase the risk of wildfire. And this summer, our skies were choked with wildfire smoke that turned the sky bronze. Due to wildfires out west and ones closer home that were exacerbated by hotter, drier conditions. It's not just about the summer. Minnesota had its first ever tornado in December in 2021. And we know that tornadoes are occurring a lot earlier and later in the season as it gets warmer and multi-tornado outbreaks are getting more frequent. What about rainfall and precipitation? Well, the warmer our winters, the more of it falls as rain and the less as snow. And we also see longer ice-free seasons on our lakes. So shorter snowmobiling seasons, shorter ice fishing, fishing seasons. We also see that our rainfall is getting stretched in both directions. So we normally have, you know, wet, dry, wet, dry. That's our normal natural patterns. But as the world warms, it's as if that natural pattern is getting stretched in both directions. When we have a drought, which we always do naturally, it's hotter and more intense and drier than it would have been because the warmer it is, the more water evaporates from our soils and our lakes and our rivers. But then when a storm comes along, as it always does naturally, there's more water vapor up in the atmosphere because warmer air holds more water vapor, for that storm to sweep up and dump on us today than there was 50 or 100 years ago. So ironically, both our heavy precipitation has increased by 40% across the whole Midwest, and our droughts are getting much more serious, like the one we experienced just last year, the worst drought in 40 years in Minnesota. Why does this matter? It matters because it affects us. It affects Minnesota's ecosystems. Warming waters affect cold water fish. Walleyes are being replaced by bass and panfish. There's fewer trout in cold water streams. We see iconic species shifting out of Minnesota. And I see this in Ontario where I'm from myself. The loon, which is the state bird, could disappear from Minnesota by the end of the century. Birds like the trumpeter swan or the spruce grouse or several different types of warblers could become locally extinct. Moose might vanish from the state as their range shrinks northward. Many pollinators that pollinate the prairies will struggle as changing wildfire or changing weather affects wildfire season and their cycles no longer align. We're seeing pest-borne diseases like Lyme disease and West Nile virus moving across Minnesota. We used to think of things like that as, you know, more southern issues, but no, they're here today. And it's not just about the natural environment. Obviously, we're being affected too. As heavy rainfall has increased in some parts of Minnesota, home insurance rates have skyrocketed as flood risk has increased. We know that corn yields are decreasing as it gets warmer. We know that winter recreation jobs are affected significantly. Less snow, less snowmobiling, less ice fishing, less cross-country skiing, less outdoor skating. And we know that our cities are being affected because in the summers, not only do we have our urban heat island effect, where um, cities are warmer than the surrounding area due to all the concrete and dark surfaces that soak up the sun's energy, but we also know that heat waves are getting worse. So for example, in the core of the Twin Cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, it's already two degrees Fahrenheit warmer in the summer compared to surrounding greener, more rural areas. But during heat waves, this difference can get as much as nine degrees different. So it's nine degrees hotter in the city compared to outside during a heat wave. And then where you are in the city matters. So climate change affects all of us, but it affects some of us more. And let me give you a concrete example. Uh, many low-income neighborhoods in major U.S. cities were historically redlined. Racist practices by lending agencies and insurance agencies. That means that a lot of these low-income neighborhoods are, um, they have a lot of concrete. They have no green space. They are located in flood zones because it's more affordable to live there. But they're more at risk from air pollution, from flood, and from heat. In fact, overall, the city might be nine degrees warmer, but it could be maybe five degrees warmer in a more wealthy, leafy, green, shadier area, and it could be 15 degrees warmer in a lower-income neighborhood. 
during a heat wave where there's, there's no trees, there's no grass, people struggle to pay their air conditioning bills or might not even want to open their, their window at night to cool off because it isn't safe. So climate change affects all of us, but it affects some of us more. Climate solutions benefit all of us, although they benefit some of us more. Remember, what do we have to talk about? Why climate change matters and what we can do to fix it. So what do solutions look like? Well, at the big scale, there's three big things we have to do. We need to cut our carbon emissions through efficiency and clean energy. Often people don't realize that 50% of U.S. carbon emissions could be cut just through efficiency alone and we'd save money. And then transitioning to clean energy sources like the wind and the sun that don't run out on us with battery backup because, of course, the sun doesn't always shine and the wind doesn't always blow, right? Also, hydropower, too, is something we have a lot of in the Great Lakes. But we also need to take carbon out of the atmosphere. And how do we do that? Through nature-based solutions. Why? Because we have too much carbon in the atmosphere, but when we put it back in the soils or the biosphere, it's a great thing. So increasing the ability of our soils, our agriculture, our forests, our grasslands to take carbon out of the atmosphere is a fantastic climate solution. And then lastly, we also have to build resilience to the impacts that are already here. Because climate is already changing and we are already being affected and we need to make sure our homes, our neighborhoods, our public transportation systems, our power grid, our water supply, our food and our agricultural systems, we need to make sure they're all prepared for the climate of the future not the climate of the past. So what does Minnesota look like? Well, Minnesota has a Next Generation Energy Act that sets targets to reduce state heat trapping gas emissions. But Minnesota did not hit the 2015 target, a 15% reduction from 2005 levels. We're only at 7% reduction today and we're not on track for 2025. So more needs to be done. And the current administration plans to release a new Minnesota Climate Action Framework very soon. What do we need to do? We need to implement solutions that make sense for people, that save us money, that increase our efficiency, that make us less wasteful, that um, move in the direction Texas is moving by looking at clean energy sources. We already get 23% of our electricity in Texas from clean energy sources. Many people don't realize that. But that also invest in natural climate solutions. Now, natural climate solutions are not just planting trees. Of course, planting trees is a great thing, but that's only a tiny piece of the pie. Natural climate solutions in Minnesota could reduce emission, current emissions by 16%. That's actually the 2015 goal that was missed. It's the equivalent of taking seven coal plants offline. And what does that look like? Yes, it does look like reforestation, which is tree planting, but it also means a lot of work in agriculture through cover cropping and reduced tilling, no-till fields, that take the carbon and agricultural waste and plow it back into the soil. This has a lot of win-wins because not only does it increase carbon content in the soil and take up carbon from the atmosphere, it's an incredible fertilizer and it helps farmers' crops be more drought resistant and more heat resistant as well. The Nature Conservancy, who I serve as the chief scientist for, and their partners in Minnesota are also working on climate-proofing the prairies and the grasslands and planting the forests of the future. So we're not planting the trees that were native to Minnesota 50 years ago, but rather planting the trees that will be native to Minnesota 50 years from now. There's so many good solutions that we can engage in to make our cities stronger and more resilient, to help people who live in areas that are prone to flooding or extreme heat, to invest in rural economies to grow more food and more crops to support the economy, and to invest in nature to help it help us. We all depend on this planet for the air that it provides that we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, the resources we use, the materials we use to make everything we have comes from this planet. And that's why to care about climate change, you only have to be one thing. And that one thing is simply a human being living on planet Earth. Climate change affects all of us. Climate solutions benefit us all. So what are we waiting for? Change begins with a conversation today. Wow, that was pretty amazing. Thank you for uh, sharing your remarks, Dr. Hayhoe. I, I felt like you were um, speaking my love language, which is make it plain. Like let's 
recapture the narrative. And uh, I often think about climate change as climate chaos to the point you were making. Like it just creates chaos in all of the ways that we live as humans. And when you start to talk about it in a different way, and to talk about these extreme weather events, um, there's this opportunity, I think, to depoliticize the issue and really have a conversation, like you said, um, and to create opportunities for people to see what the future could be and not to avoid our current situation. Um, I loved in your book where you talk a bit about how 7% of Americans are the only people who don't acknowledge <laughs> that the climate is changing. But the other 93% do. And you talk a bit about how many of us feel immobilized because we don't know what to do. And in my grandmother's parlance, she would say, we just keep kicking the can down the road. And so I'm wondering from your perspective, how do we bridge across that 93%? Because we know that 93% has different political views, they use different language, and that language sometimes can be very inflammatory. So I'm curious from your view, like what's the language and what's the approach for us to build bridges so that we can actually solve this problem as a, a global community, but particularly in our states and in our country? Mm -hmm. Today is a time when we desperately need to be building bridges much more than digging trenches. And here's the way I think about it. If we can come together on climate change, which is and has been for over a decade the most politically polarized issue in the United States, what else might we be able to come together on? So over the last few years, wherever I go, whoever I'm talking to, I have heard the same two questions. What gives you hope? And how do I have a conversation about this? Because I'm worried, but I don't know what to do, so I'm not talking about it. So this past year, I wrote a new book that just came out that you alluded to. It's called Saving Us, not saving the planet, saving us. And the subtitle is A Climate Scientist Case for Hope and Healing in a Divided World. And in it, I explain how if we begin our conversations with something we agree on and have in common and share... And then we connect the dots to how climate change is affecting it. And then we bring in practical, positive solutions that we can engage in or that others are engaging in to help us see that, yes, it really can be fixed. That's where we can have the amazing conversations. So how do we begin these conversations? Well, I recommend taking an inventory of who you are and what you care about. So you live in Minnesota. You might be a parent. You might be somebody who lives in a rural community or in an urban neighborhood. You might be a person of faith who attends a particular you know, church or place of worship. You might be a member of the Rotary Club, or you might be really into beer, or you might be into kayaking or fishing or snowmobiling or um, canoeing or cross-country skiing. Starting a conversation with something we agree on, connecting the dots to how climate change is affecting every single one of those things, rural or urban, kayaking or skiing, our children or our food that we eat, and then showing people how who they already are, the perfect person to care, is how we have these conversations. But often when people hear me say that, they say, aha, I have a colleague or a neighbor or an uncle or a relative-in-law who can't leave this thing alone. They bring it up all the time. They're posting on Facebook about how it's all a hoax. We cannot have a family dinner without them bringing up how scientists are just making this all up to line their pockets. Now I know how to go have a conversation with them. I'm gonna show them. Here's the problem. Those people who are called dismissives because they will dismiss 200 years of science, 2000 climate scientists, 2 million scientific papers, those people are the only ones we can't convince because it's not about the facts and it's not about the figures. They've decided due to solution aversion that they don't want to fix it. And so they will search for anything that will justify that position. And if you, if you show how one argument's wrong, like they say, oh, well, just, you know, one volcanic eruption produces more pollution than all humans. And you say, no, as a matter of fact, all the geologic activity on the whole planet produces as much heat trapping gas as a, as a few small states. Just like the whack-a-mole game at the county fair, they'll just go on to another argument and another one and another one. So the seven percenters, as I call them, in, in saving us, they're the only ones we can't convince. But the rest of us, we can. How? 
by beginning with something we share, connecting the dots to how climate change is affecting us here and now in ways that are relevant to us today, and then by bringing up positive constructive solutions for our city, for our state, in our industry or our business or our church or our neighborhood or our organization, there are so many amazing solutions out there that we can talk about, you know, that make us feel encouraged, that make us feel like, yes, this thing can be fixed, and that make us feel like, how can I help? Mm. So what I love about what you just said is, uh, is that we do have to focus on those who care. Like if we can get a coalition of the willing, moving and acting, we can solve the problem. A lot of times I talk about this as a 70-20-10 principle, meaning that like on any tough issue, that in most cases, regardless of what side of the aisle you sit on, you 70%, 60 to 70% of the facts we agree on, right? And then I think there's probably another 20% that we can negotiate on. And then there's that 10% you will never agree on. But it's odd that when we start these conversations, we always start at the 10% and we never move ourselves along. So I'm really curious about and, and, and excited about this notion of what you're talking about, building a civic muscle that actually allows us to solve climate um, challenges or to slow them severely, and then to move on to this question of uh, how do we then solve additional problems. But here's the question I have for you. We know there's 93% that really care about this, as you just said, and we talked about already that sometimes we're polarized in the way that we hear and talk about these things. So I'm really curious from your perspective about messengers. And uh, one of our listeners, Hillary Lynch, raised this question. And she basically is saying, like, we deny what we're hearing because we don't believe in the messenger. And so I'm curious, do we change the messenger? Uh, Hillary says, do we find more trustworthy messengers like you that help us understand? What's your thought about messengers and how we start to penetrate and bring that 93% together so that we can be more of a united front? Hillary is absolutely right. We are all these days cognitive misers. And what that means is None of us have the time or the bandwidth to fully inform ourselves on all of the issues that are being debated in civil society today. We just don't have the time. So what do we do? We go to people whose values we share, who we identify with, and we listen to what they have to say about it and we adopt their opinions as our own. And so that's why we need messengers from all aspects of our society. I mentioned earlier when I was speaking that the most effective messenger is not me, it's you. And by that I mean that friends and family, people we know, they are the most effective messenger, the most trusted messenger, and the best at changing our minds and helping us understand why we care about something. Again, not the seven percenters. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about everybody else. We scientists are okay. And there's other trusted messengers too, like broadcast meteorologists. And in Minnesota, you have a wonderful one, Paul Douglas. But even Paul realizes that it's about bringing our whole self to the table. So Paul Douglas got together with a Christian pastor called Mitch Hescox, and they wrote a book about caring for creation and evangelical perspective on climate change. Then there's military leaders who speak out about how climate change is a threat multiplier and a serious military concern. I'm a mother, so I help to co-found a group called Science Moms that's all about helping parents understand what they can say to their kids when their kids ask what's happening and what they can do to fight for their children's future. As a person of faith myself, I often speak to others who share my faith, and I encourage other people who might be really interested, you know, I, I personally don't hunt, and I, I grew up fishing a lot when I was young, because I grew up on the lakes in Ontario, but I don't fish that much anymore. So I encourage people who are parts of those communities to talk about how climate change matters if you do hunt or you do fish, or you are in the snowmobiling community, or if you're in the skiing community. Whoever we are, wherever we live, we all have different lived experiences and different reasons to care, and that's totally fine. But that means that we are the perfect messenger to the group of people that we most identify with. And let me tell you a story uh, from my book, and this has actually happened to me a couple of times, um, where I, I was giving a talk at a university, and a fellow scientist came up to me afterwards and said, I've really been taking this message to heart. 
that the most important thing we can do is to talk about it. And I know that as scientists, we are fairly trusted messengers. And so I have been trying to reach out to our local um, congregations to get them on board because obviously, you know, every major world religion has aspects of caring for, you know, or, or uh, caring for nature or creation and caring for those less fortunate than us, our brothers and our sisters who are most impacted by climate change. And so they've said, you know, I've, I've been trying to get my foot in the door in some of our, you know, more conservative Christian churches in my area, and I just can't. What would you recommend? So I said, well, the best place to start where you're going to be the most trusted messenger is with the group that you have the most in common with. So, you know, what is your own faith background? Where, you know, what type of congregation do you attend? And in, in, in both of these cases, the scientist said, oh, I don't. I'm an atheist. So I said, well, in that case, stop. You're not the trusted messenger for a faith-based group, but you are the trusted messenger for somebody else. So let's talk about what you love. And in both cases, the scientist said, well, science. <laughs> I said, well, of course, and that's why we're scientists. But I said, you know, uh, do you hike? Are you part of a community group? Are you part of the Rotary Club? Are you, no, 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 no. And then finally, in sort of a doubtful tone, he said, well, I do dive. And this was, this was a, a West Coast conversation. I said, well, there you go. Don't you think divers need to know about climate change? The impact on the oceans is actually far greater than what's happening on land. In fact, the only reason we don't know that is, I think, because we're not dolphins. If we lived in the ocean, we'd be talking about it all the time. So I said, well, what if you went to your local PADI certification programs and offered to talk about climate change there? So the most trusted messenger, bottom line, is whoever we share the most with. And that is why we need everyone. We need Republicans and Democrats talking about this because a thermometer doesn't give you a different answer depending on how you vote. And a flood doesn't knock on your door and say, could I see your voting record over the last 10 years before it floods your basement? We need faith leaders talking about it. We need sport leaders. We need business leaders. We need community leaders. We need parents and grandparents and teachers and kids and young people talking about it. Bottom line is we need everybody and you are the perfect person to talk about it with people who you share what you love, where you love, who you love, where you live, your life experiences. You're the perfect person to talk about climate change with people who share that with you. Well, I'm so energized after hearing you talk about that, um, particularly because I often think that we are not narrating what's happening for people in a way that they can hear it. And when you just talk briefly about um, basement flooding, my sister's basement, who lives in Detroit, her basement flooded three times this summer due to flooding. And uh, all of the conversation was about how do we build infrastructure that can handle the flooding? And never was a conversation about the flooding is happening because the earth is warming and that we're not taking that seriously. And so when I helped her understand that, she said, well, then when I go to the city council meeting, I'm going to talk about climate change. And uh, so that's a great example of me being a supportive person who's talking about um, climate to the people you love. But I'll give you another example where I talk to my husband about it and it's like I'm mostly shaming him. <laughs> don't do this. Don't do that. So we all, even though we are the right messengers, we have to work on our message because you have helped us understand and you're advocating for us to say, stop being accusatory, stop being judgmental, be more curious. And so I'm wondering, um, are there things that we're doing when we're talking to people that are counterproductive that we just need to stop if we really want to get people engaged and to move from um, this uh, stalled position where they're denying what's happening or not even necessarily denying it, but don't feel like they can contribute to the solution? I'm so glad you asked that. And the answer to that is yes. There are many ways that we are communicating on climate change and on other issues that is just profoundly unproductive. So when I was speaking earlier, I mentioned the first of these, which is just dumping a lot of fear-based facts on people. It turns out if you're already worried and you're not activated, it's because you don't know what to do. And more fear is just going to make you want to go back to bed and pull the covers back over your head, so to speak. It's not going to make you want to do anything about it. And then you mentioned another thing that's very unproductive, which is beginning the conversation with the 10% that we disagree on. You're just trying to pick a fight there. 
And picking a fight is a lose-lose proposition. Even if you, quote, win, so to speak, you haven't really won because you haven't got the other person with you. You've just alienated them further. So really just trying to scare the pants off people or focusing on what divides us rather than what unites us, which is nearly always a lot less because, you know, at its most fundamental level, we're all humans. We live on planet Earth. We depend on it for everything that we breathe and eat and drink and, and use so much we have in common, so little that divides us, yet all of our conversation, all of our media, all of our discussion, everything online seems to be about the little tiny bit that divides us. But there's one more thing we're doing that isn't, isn't productive either. And that is when we see the world changing and when we get really worried about what's happening, our human instinct is we want to try to control the situation. So we might control what we do very rigidly, but then it's never enough. We feel like I did everything I could to reduce my personal carbon footprint. And then I hear about airlines during the pandemic running thousands of empty flights just to keep their gate assignments. So we feel overwhelmed with guilt, but we feel like there's nothing we can do. And even worse is when we try to control not just ourselves, we try to control other people by guilting, shaming, and judging them. Other people who might already be worried, but they don't know what to do. Or other people who might not have options, yet we shame them for doing what they're doing. And this is particularly toxic online. Last year, um, I saw one of my colleagues, a climate scientist, who flew home to see her father before he passed away. And that's a situation under which all of us would immediately want to, you know, fly to the, to the bedside of a loved one if we had a chance to see them and say a few things to them before we lost them. She was just, I can't even find the words to describe how foully she was shamed as a climate scientist, not by other scientists, but by people who were worried about climate change for flying to see her dying father. And I understand where that reaction is coming from. It's coming from fear, from fear of the overwhelming nature of this crisis and that we feel like we're not doing enough to fix it. But I'm not out to change people's lifestyles. I'm out to change the world. And I'm not out to stop everybody from flying. I'm out to get every flight we get on to be a carbon neutral flight. And you know what? Some airlines are even doing that. And United is actually the biggest one. They, they use more low carbon biofuels than any other airline put together across the whole planet. I'm not out to, you know, you know, shame people for not pu taking public transit or buying an EV. I'm out to make EVs the cheapest cars and public transit available to everybody who needs it. That's what we're there for. And so shaming and guilting each other as individuals, it might, you know, you might have a short knee-jerk change just to get people off your back, but long-term, it just makes me feel like, oh yeah, what do you know about my life? And it makes us dig in our heels even more. And if we're the ones doing the guilting or the shaming, it makes us feel temporarily better, kind of like a shot of caffeine in the middle of the afternoon, but then it wears off very quickly and we have to go guilt or shame somebody else to feel temporarily better. It is a very unhealthy reaction when what we really need to do is, you know, get more sleep, exercise regularly, make sure we're getting some sunshine, do the right thing, so to speak, so that we understand that, yes, we can fix this. And the right things are focusing on what's being done right and communicating with other people why it matters and what we can do together to fix it. Oh, yeah, I love what you just said, largely because we all know, I mean, when we think about change management, change leadership, we know that different people react to change in different ways. And in order to get people to enroll in changing, they have to see that the future is can be just as strong as the current or in most cases better. And so I just love those examples of um, what you talked, you just spoke about. One of the other things that um, your remarks raised for me was this question about prioritization. So we're right now in this place where we have converging crises, right? So we have, we're in the middle of a pandemic. As you know, uh, in uh, Minneapolis is where George Floyd was murdered and kicked off this kind of global spanning of uprising and um, a racial reckoning that has happened in our country. And some people would say, like one of these things is more important than the other. Now, I know you don't believe that, <laughs> but I, it, that we can do more than one thing at a time. And sometimes they can be even uh, reinforcing of each other. But I'm wondering, how do you help people think about all of these converging crises and think about how you prioritize what's most important and how they're intertwined? 
Well, that is such a good question because it just seems like the issues that are confronting us in this world, whether it's um, racial marginalization, whether it's the increasing socioeconomic divide between the haves and the have-nots, whether it's the increasing um, acrimonious disputes between people over things that we would think are very basic, like vaccines that we all got as children somehow have become political touch points. And then you got climate change on top of that. And people think, you know, I don't have enough bandwidth, you know, take a seat, take a number like at the deli. We'll deal with that issue later. Let's focus on these things now. Well, the way I've image, I pictured is this. It's like we have these buckets that we're trying to fill. And the buckets are problems that are things that are wrong with this world. And we're pouring all of our effort and our time and our money into the bucket. And then along come the climate scientists and like, oh, you have to add another bucket to the end of your list, climate change. And we think, I just can't do this. I'm just trying to get food on the table. I'm worried about my kids. I'm worried about my parents. I'm worried about my city and my job. I do not have time for this. And I hear, I hear that. I feel the same way too often, and I'm a climate scientist. But here's the image that helps me understand. Climate change is not a separate bucket. Climate change is the hole in every other bucket. Climate change and air pollution from fossil fuel emissions affect our kids' health. Climate change affects lower-income neighborhoods, more than higher income ones. Climate change has already increased the economic gap between the have and the have nots by as much as 25% between lower and higher income countries at the global scale. Climate change exacerbates gender inequality, exacerbates racial inequality, exacerbates socioeconomic inequality. The United Nations has these very basic sustainable development goals of no poverty, no hunger, access to clean water and basic sanitation for all. There's no way to accomplish any of those if we don't patch the hole in the bucket. And that's what climate change is. And that's why climate change matters to all of us, no matter what our buckets are. But on the flip side, I don't want to end with the risk. We have to talk about the solutions too. Climate solutions can also address socioeconomic inequality by reducing energy costs and improving public transportation. They can address uh, racial inequality by empowering marginalized people and elevating voices that have not been heard. They can address issues of gender equity. Empowering women and girls, especially in low-income countries, is actually a climate solution. They can ensure food and clean air and clean water and sanitation and good jobs. There's many more jobs in the clean energy industry today in the United States than in the whole coal industry put together. Climate solutions can be solutions for everything else we're worried about. And we don't have time to do solutions that only fix one thing. We need win, 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 win solutions. And that's where a lot of our uh, clean energy, efficiency, and nature-based solutions come in. They tackle all kinds of problems today. Oh, and they help with climate change later. So the only question is, why aren't we doing them? That's exactly right. And one of the things that it makes me think about is uh, two of our listeners, Jean-Pierre and Jim, both raised these questions about rich countries like the United States, um, who are the worst at carbon emissions, and we are not doing enough. And as a result, there are so many poor countries across our globe that are feeling the impact of our actions. Um, and it makes me think about the Midwest. You talked so much about Minnesota, and one of the most startling uh, kind of facts that I've learned is that if the Midwest was a country, if we took all of the states and just made it a country and put it out onto the ocean, we would actually be the fifth largest carbon emitter in the world between Japan and Russia. And so we really do, as a country, have to tackle this challenge because we're creating um, even deeper social imbalances and that we're not really combating the environmental and racial injustices that are global. So I'm just wondering how you think about this um, question of uh, how, our, how these more industrialized and richer countries are showing up and what we need to do in order to create um, movement for every country across the globe, and particularly those who are not uh, necessarily contributing as much to the problem, but are experiencing outsized impact of the problem. Mm -hmm. I'm so glad that both Jim and Jean-Pierre brought that up because 
Not only are climate impacts not distributed equally, but our responsibility for the problem isn't equal either. The 3.5 billion poorest people in the world, that's almost half the world, they're responsible for 7% of carbon emissions. 7%. Yet they are the ones who are most impacted. As I alluded to earlier, the poorest countries in the world have become poorer already due to the impacts of climate change on drought, famine, stronger tropical storms, rising seas. The gap between those poor and rich countries has increased by as much as 25%. Even though we're still being impacted, we're less vulnerable, we're more prepared, and we're more northern. If you look at the top emitters... What matters is not our annual emissions, it's our cumulative emissions. It's We put a new brick on the pile every month, and those bricks have gotten bigger and bigger over time. And what matters is the whole pile of bricks, not just the brick we put on this month. When we look at that pile, the United States alone is responsible for almost 30% of the entire pile of bricks. Almost 30%. China is responsible for about 12%. India is increasing. Canada, if there's any listeners from north of the border, well, we're number nine on the top list, top 10 list. We do not get a pass either. So we have these countries that historically have contributed the most, like Western Europe, the United States, Canada, Russia, and others. And then we have the emerging economies like China and India that are growing very rapidly, that on an annual basis, China has already overtaken the U.S. annually. And they have economies that also need to transition to clean energy. We have to do this together. In the meantime, you have the vast majority of countries in the world saying, we contribute almost nothing to the problem. We're bearing the brunt of the impacts. How is this fair? We need solutions that work for everyone. We need efficiency. We need clean energy. We need nature-based solutions and agricultural solutions. We need solutions that build resilience. And we need to work together again across neighborhoods in the same city across states in the same country, and across countries around the world, because we all share this planet. We can't build walls all the way up to the top of the atmosphere that somehow surround and protect our home or our city or our state or our country from everyone else. Our supply chains, our economy, our flow of goods, our families even in our personal relationships are spread around the world in many cases. And that's why we have to do this together. And that's why um, the Paris Agreement and events like the big climate meeting in Glasgow that happened this past November are so important because that's a chance for countries to get together and for some of the small island states who literally the future of their entire country depends on the choices the high emitting countries make. They could be 100% underwater and have nothing left. That's why it's so important for those people to get together and look each other in the eyes and say, what are we doing together for a better future for all of us? Because there's no way to get that better future for just a few. Either we all get it or none of us get it ultimately. Yeah, and it makes me think about um, global climate equity is the way I would probably describe it. It's, it's about doing our share to solve the problem, but also doing our share to make sure that the climate solutions get to the places with the greatest need. Because that's the way that we're going to come out of this situation where everyone thrives. And this really, is, to your point, everyone can thrive. So earlier, uh, you talked about in one of your examples was the scientist who was an atheist who was trying to go to, into churches to help convince them, uh, which I think is so funny, um, but so important because a lot of times we believe that um, we can reach anyone, that science can reach anyone. But in actuality, everybody isn't always driven by science or driven by facts. Um, actually, people are, many people are driven by faith. And I know that you are a woman of faith and it helped bring you to um, prioritizing this issue of climate and particularly how we take care of the earth. I wonder if you would just kind of talk a little bit about that. Um, and ground us in um, how your faith values and how other people's faith values should point to why we take this issue seriously and why we have to be a part of the solution. Mm -hmm. Well, I love that you brought it up because that's really about engaging not just our heads, but our hearts. Most of our heads are already there, so to speak. We, we, most of us know it's real. Most of us are worried. And a lot of us might not even admit that we are, but we do. So we've got the head part. 
but we need to connect it to our hearts to understand why we care. And then we need to connect it to our hands so that we can actually act. So the first step to connecting our heads to our hearts is to say, well, what is in our hearts? What's important to us? What do we value? What do we care about? What, what do we build our identity on? Who am I? And for me, a big part of who I am is I am a Christian. And I believe that the Bible says that we humans have responsibility to care for every living thing on this planet, which includes plants, animals, and fellow humans. And I also believe that we are to be recognized, and these are the words of Jesus, by our love for others. How different would the world look if Christians were recognized by love? Very different. And what is a failure to act on climate other than a failure to love? When it's the poorest and most vulnerable, most marginalized people, our sisters and our brothers, right here at home, as well as on the other side of the world, who are being most impacted by a changing climate. So the reason I'm a climate scientist and not an astrophysicist, as my undergraduate degree was in and what I was planning to be, the reason I'm a climate scientist is because I'm a Christian. Because I took a class serendipitously, one of those accidents that you look back in hindsight and realize was probably no accident at all. Um, I had to finish my undergrad degree before I went on to graduate school, where I thought I was going to be studying galaxies. And there was a brand new class on climate change over in the geography department. I thought, well, that looks interesting. Why not take it? So I did. And I was completely shocked to learn, not that climate change was real, because I'd already you know, grown up learning about that in, in Ontario, but I was completely shocked to learn that it was so urgent and that it was so unfair. And so it was my heart, not my head, that said, I need to do everything I can to help fix this because it is not fair. It is not right. It is not just. And we need to do, those of us especially, who have the ability and the privilege to dedicate our lives to this, or even, you know, depending, it doesn't matter, you don't have to be a scientist. You can be a communicator, you can be a journalist, you can be a teacher, you can be a parent. You can be active in your local Rotary Club. You could be somebody who goes, you know, who goes out on the lake with some fellow water enthusiasts to sail or kayak. Whoever we are, we can do something about this because of what we love. And so that's why I often speak to others who share my faith, Christian colleges or Christian groups. But I also encourage others to speak to the, those who um, they share their faith with because as I mentioned earlier, just about every major world religion has traditions of caring for, being good stewards of nature or creation, and caring for those less fortunate than us. So there are interfaith groups like Interfaith Power and Light that's active in Minnesota. There are Christian groups like the Evangelical Environmental Network and the Catholic Climate Covenant. The Lutheran Church, the Episcopalian Church have um, climate actions, climate statements, things that you can do and, and learn from and read and use. There's organizations like Green Muslims Everybody has a way to connect who they already are and what they already care about to climate change. And for many people, faith is a big way to do that. Yeah, and no, I appreciate that uh, so much because I just recently started rereading Genesis. And it's one of the first things that God tells us to do if you're a Christian yes. is to take care of the earth. And we haven't done that, obviously, because we're in this crisis now. And um, so one of the things you've done in your career, which has been really interesting, is that you've helped author three of the national climate assessments to tell us where we are and how we're doing. And uh, Tim Durr, uh, who was also one of our listeners, he's been thinking and worrying about that the projections that we've made about climate seem to uh, be... Um, going, our earth is getting warmer than we thought based on the projections. And I loved your analogy that you had about your body temperature and the earth's temperature. So I'm just wondering, can you just talk a little bit about, like not too technical, uh, mostly for me, I ask, not for anybody else, but just really curious from your perspective about like um, how we, um, can keep these commitments to reduce our carbon footprint so that we can actually um, ensure that uh, we are making good projections. And, um, and then just any thoughts you might have about Tim's question about if we're outpacing our projections, what, what does that make us worry about and what does it make us do? What should it make us do in these moments? Mm-hmm. 
So as a scientist, I've served as a lead author on the second and third and fourth U.S. national climate assessments, and I'm working on number five actually right now. And if anyone's interested, they can find them online. So volume one is at science2017.globalchange.gov, G-O-V. And then the second part is online at NCA, NCA stands for National Climate Assessment, nca2018.globalchange.gov. And they're pretty readable because they're written not for scientists, but more for, you know, city planners or land managers or engineers or people who need climate information to make decisions. Why did I spend so much of my completely 100% unpaid time on the national climate assessments? It's because they directly tackle psychological distance. They show how climate is changing right here right now and how it is affecting our water systems, our food systems, our cities, our rural areas, our land, our infrastructure, our health, and more. That's why they're so important. But what they also show is that if anything, we scientists have been conservative with our projections. We have sort of been, been cautious and hesitant to say how bad this truly is. It's no exaggeration to say this. And I actually wrote an essay with one of my authors, co-authors, Bob Kopp from Rutgers, once we finished writing it, the chapter on potential surprises, how there's really some very nasty potential surprises if we continue on our current pathway. We wrote an essay together that said this, we are truly conducting an unprecedented experiment with the only home we have. Unprecedented. And the further and farther we get away from the conditions that we humans are perfectly adapted to over the course of human civilization on this planet, the greater the risks for all of us. And so the biggest thing the science says is, again, in the words of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, every year matters. Every bit of warming matters. Everything we can do to slow this thing down, stop it, and eventually turn it around, everything we do makes a difference. For who? Not for the planet. For us. And for many of the other living things that share this planet with us. Well, thank you so much. Uh this has been a fascinating conversation, and I thought maybe we just end with one final question. So, of course, your book talks about this, hope. And in your, your recent New York Times interview, you distinguish between this notion of a false hope or wishful thinking that things are going to get better and a hope that actually inspires action. And one of our viewers, um, Patrick Collins from Lindstrom, Minnesota, who is a seventh grade life science teacher, and my understanding, a pretty much a rock star in our state because he's helping young people really understand. His students are learning about this, but they're also seeing that we're not making enough progress. So I'm wondering if you talk about hope and maybe talk to Patrick's students about what, uh, what gives you hope and uh, what, what part of hope inspires others to act. I absolutely can. And the first thing I would say is you are not alone. The number one question I have gotten from anyone, anywhere, the last four or five years, anywhere in the world is, what gives you hope? Why do we need hope? Because things are bad. We don't need hope if everything's going fine. We don't need hope if a better future is guaranteed. We don't need hope if we know for sure that someone's going to step up and fix this thing for us and we just have to be a little more patient. We don't need hope. That would be false hope or that would be wishful thinking, as you said. We need hope when things are bad. We need hope when things are going to get worse. We need hope when the only way that we're going to get to a better future for ourselves and for our kids who we love so much, like to all teachers do, the, we need hope when the only way we're going to get that better future and ensure that better future for them is if we do everything we can and then some. That's when we need hope. I was speaking earlier with a group of scientists just today, and one of them said, do we have time for hope? And I said, how do we not have time for hope? Because hope, true hope, rational hope says it's bad and it could get worse, but if we do everything we can, we can make a difference. And if we don't think we could make a difference, why would we even act? So hope begins with understanding that we can do something, that the giant boulder of climate action is not sitting at the bottom of the hill with only a few hands on it. And if we add ours, it will never budge. That giant boulder is already at the top of the hill and it's rolling down the hill in the right direction. It just isn't going fast enough. What makes it go faster? When we add our hand 
and when we use our voice to encourage others to add theirs too. So what gives us hope is action. As Joan Baez, the famous singer, once said, despair, we often feel despair, right? But what's the antidote to despair? It is action. That's where we find our hope. When we act, when we add our hand to the boulder and we realize, wow, looking around, look at all the other hands that are on the boulder. People I had no idea were acting, their hands are on the boulder too. It's going a little bit faster. Maybe we might be able to do this thing, but we need more people. Let's go out and find them too. That's where we find our hope from action. And so one of the most hopeful things for me is looking at what young people are doing. I have a little YouTube series I alluded to earlier called Global Weirding, which is perfect for teachers and families to uh, talk about climate change. And one of the common questions I got is, I'm just a kid, what can I do? So I started to research what kids are doing and it blew me away. Of course, there's the kids' climate strikes, but there's also kids creating technology that charges your cell phone from the wind or the sun. There's kids, you know, advocating that their city council have a climate resilience plan. There's kids suing federal governments in the United States and Canada and Germany for their right to a better future. There's kids who are acting at every level to make a difference. And if the kids can do it, can't we all do it? So that was the most hopeful thing to me was seeing who all's hands are already on the boulder and the fact that, you know what, if I add mine, maybe it will make a difference too. That's where our hope comes from. I want to close with the words of, of one of my favorite authors, Catherine Wilkinson. She co-edited a wonderful book called All We Can Save, which I love the title of that, All We Can Save from Climate Change, that has 60 essays from different women working in the climate field. And she said this, she said, it's a magnificent time to be alive in a moment that matters so much. Yes, I love that. I just want to uh, say in conclusion uh, that you give us hope. You help us see um, that solving this crisis isn't just about science. It's about hope. It's about love. It's about faith. It's about action. And it's about us. That's what you brought to this conversation. And I hope we all um, really grasp those notions that we can do it together uh, and that we can bring our full selves to solve this problem. And so I just want to thank you for your inspiring words, your inspiring work that will take this moment, as you just said, make it a, a uh, worthwhile moment for all of us to be alive as we move the needle on this important issue. So thank you so much, Dr. Hayhoe. Thank you.